So welcome, welcome, welcome our brilliant colleague, Gabby. We so appreciate your consistent leadership and solidarity. And as always at Set C, we begin all things by giving thanks and acknowledging our creator. We acknowledge all the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toil without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So Gabby, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and share a bit about your remarkable work? Sure, I will. And Victor, before I start, I just want to say thanks to you because I think you're giving so many people voices on important topics um, and really getting it out there and hopefully reinforcing some of the work that we're all doing. So you're an inspiration, I think, as well. So, so thanks for having me. Um, so as Victor mentioned, my name's uh, Gabby Polanco Sorto. Uh, I'm a strategist by background, um, but with an emphasis on sustainability and purpose. Uh, and I've worked in this space for over 20 years, primarily in uh, multinational financial institutions. And so for some, it may be rare um, that I've really built a career of social impact, specifically uh, in big bang and big insurance, uh, and looking at topics uh, that are widespread. And because I've been around for so long, um, I've got a privilege to learn a lot of this on the ground uh, by building. Um, and for me, I think that this is sustainability in particular and social impact and purpose are spaces that people that generally love to learn and have a learning mindset thrive in um, because there's no answer. Uh, and we're constantly learning new things, engaging with new people. Um, and if you have that learning mindset, you really thrive. And so because back when I started, um, there weren't necessarily degrees in this space, I got to learn about social impact. I got to learn about climate change when organizations are just starting to figure this out. Um, and so I've been able to, to work in vastly different topics, everything from um, looking at HIV AIDS in the Caribbean uh, to looking at indigenous relations and how to build uh, you know, true partnerships and collaboration with community uh, to identifying uh, the impacts of climate change. And so uh, I've been incredibly fortunate to have been in this space and 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 have been on this journey with, with a couple of organizations that have been really leading the way. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for all that context. And as well, every time we connect so over the past while I always learn something new. So I appreciate once again, that learning lifestyle that's I think we're both committed mm -hmm. to. Yeah. So my next question is, what's inspiring you right now? What has you curious? What's lighting your, your fire? I think other leaders in this space, especially those that you're giving voice to who, who we haven't been hearing from a lot in the past, are really coming out um, with a new call to action. And that, I think, has really um, reinforced, I think, my fire in terms of the work that I do and, and what I'm hoping that we as an industry can achieve. And Part of this, I think, is the promises that came out of COVID and, you know, the impact that that had on so many different social narratives and aspects and topics that we've been trying to grapple with. And I think it really took away the uh, the fake security that we had been trying to propose around all these different societal issues that we've been touching upon. And I think for me, when when COVID first hit, what was fascinating is that organizations um, that had true partnership with charitable partners were able to action solutions in support of those industries so quickly and were there for their partners because they understood their needs, they knew where they were gonna be challenged. And yet you had a whole slew of big organizations literally making calls to charity saying, we've never worked with you before, tell us what you need. Um, and charities didn't have time for that. And so their PR teams were trying to figure out what are we gonna say of how we're helping? And it really reinforced the fact that relationships can't be built in a time of crisis. A time of crisis is a point to act. And so relationships have to be built when there is no crisis, when, you're, when there is an opportunity to build a true understanding and relationship. And so then during COVID, there was this narrative around Build Back Better and how um, the sector was going to change and, and um, trust-based giving and, and true power dynamic breakdown was going to happen. And now coming up out of COVID, uh, I'm a little bit dismayed that those narratives haven't continued and that some of those promises haven't been met. And 
when you think about the charitable sector, I mean, it's a huge sector in Canada. They make up 8% of the GDP and we're, we're, we're giving them a task of solving these huge issues and yet we're not supporting them to get there. And uh, I often say that, and there's no other word for it, but I feel like the charitable sector is coming out of a trauma of COVID where they were sitting on granting dollars that were specifically allocated for programs and yet they couldn't pay for rent. They couldn't keep the lights on. There was a huge layoff uh, action across many organizations. Many of them have folded. They didn't survive COVID. And there hasn't been, I think, enough emphasis of why that happened, how that happened. And also the corporate sector stepping up to say there needs to be a new way of granting because of what's happened post COVID. And so, um, you know, I, I work now for an organization called Gore Mutual Insurance. We're a mutual insurance company. Um, so there's a couple of factors that that uh, has allowed us to be really creative. One is that because we're a mutual insurance company, we don't have shareholders. So we're operated and governed for the benefit of our policyholders and our members. And that gives us an opportunity to actually redefine what value creation means for us. It's not about um, shareholder value. It's about creating value for a much broader group of stakeholders. And so we're able to identify what that value is and for whom. And so that's given us an opportunity to, to really embed a new thinking within our foundation. So we have a Gore Mutual Foundation. Uh, we grant close to a million dollars uh, out every year. And I think what's what's fascinating and again, incredibly privileged to be in this situation is we have a group of board members and executive team that also have that learning mindset, that that know they don't have the answers, that want to learn, want to do good by that. Um, and you don't often get that when you're working with with C-suite or with with boards, right? And so being able to go on this journey with them, we've redefined what it, what relationships mean to us from the charitable sector. I'm incredibly proud um, that for over 40% of our granting in 2023 actually was unrestricted funding, which means that we went to our charities and said, we believe in your mission. Um, we understand you, you're the experts in this field. And so we will give you a grant specifically just for you to go out and do and do you and, and build out your strategies the way that you know of. But to be able to do that, we've had to ensure that we have a trust-based relationship with these organizations that we know that they're building equity and representation at their leadership and their board level to ensure that when they say that they're meeting the needs of equity deserving groups, that they actually have those voices and decision making processes. And so we've we've had to end some relationships, change some relationships, um, but it's given us a way to say, OK, if we really believe in this, then we need to make the space for that. And um, I know that Future of Good just came out with their 2024 trends. Uh, and so those that haven't read it, definitely is a call out to go read it. Um, there was a whole section around uh, trust-based giving and how that's really fall, it fallen into the into the wayside or organizations are gonna be called on those commitments. And so I'm hoping that this momentum picks up again because we have to get the nonprofit and charitable sector stronger to meet the needs that we're asking them to solve for. I couldn't agree more. This is a conversation that we have all the time um, when, it, when, when it relates to not just public sector and philanthropic sector, but private sector partners, like relationships mm -hmm. cannot be built in a time of crisis. <laughs> and I think when we speak of that, it's so important that these relationships are cultivated over a long period of time to ensure that when something happens, we can actually meet the needs of community in real time and censor people, mm -hmm. and censor justice, right. access, inclusion, diversity, decolonization, equity, all those principles that we all um, purport to want, want values that we say that we want to censor. So I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all the context you provided because it's so necessary in terms of sustainable gi giving and sustainable mm -hmm. organizing and mobilizing. So my next question is, what challenges and barriers are you facing in your work? And how, what are some of the ways you and your team are working to overcome some of these challenges and barriers? I would say that the barriers we face have been created by us. Ourselves. It always happens. We're the biggest obstacles to ourselves. And um, part of it is around the nuance or the understanding of what impact measurement is. And impact measurement the topic itself has been around for a really long time. The corporate grant makers have been talking about it for a long time. I feel that we've been talking to each other and we haven't opened up the circle to talk more broadly about what impact should be. Um, but there's a nuance that it's always quantitative. And through my experience, you miss a lot when you want 
a hardcore number that then gets into some sort of press release or, or report without understanding the qualitative nature of the work that needs to happen. And it's also timelines, right? Like to your point, relationship building takes time. Impact takes even longer. Um, and so being able to grant multi-year uh, proposals or, or be part of the building process, knowing that it's going to take many years to get to that impact level um, is really important. And we're still stuck on cyclical annual cycles of granting, which is a huge stressor again to, to our charitable partners. It's not about building trust. It's you know, ask us for another couple of uh, dollars, you know, next year versus saying, look, we're guaranteeing your granting or we're investing in this for the next three to five years and, and help us learn with you to understand what that impact should be. And so um, I, I do very much advocate that when it's when it's about impact, we should be talk talking to our charitable partners. They are the people on the ground that understand these issues better than anything else. There's no way I'm going to be the one to tell them these are the things we want you to measure or how we define impact. And so that's been built into our granting process. That's been built into our discussions with, with charitable partners. Um, we launched uh, something called the Climate and Equity Lab, which is looking at the impact that climate change is happening, happening is having on vulnerable populations in Canada and urban centers um, in partnership with Social Innovation Canada and York University's environmental and urban change faculty, which is relatively new. And that took us a year to build just, just to come to an agreement of what this was going to look like, um, how we were going to engage uh, charitable partners, the sector, uh, you know, representatives from vulnerable populations. And what's been fascinating is what took the longest, and it was great to work with these partners, was we all wanted to agree that no one was going to own this. And this is, I think, the other part of it is getting away from needing to label anything with our corporate brand. Like, we don't want to own this initiative. We actually want other mutuals and cooperatives um, and credit unions who are who are similarly organized as us and have the same values to share this out with the world and say the research that comes out of this, the innovation that comes out of this can be actioned by other organizations much bigger than ours. And that's how you can make even greater impact. And so I think that removing those uh, initially perceived barriers of how corporate grant making is done is I think part of the biggest challenge. And we've, we've been, again, been really fortunate um, that our board and our executive team are really open to learning about this um, and helping us deconstruct some of those pieces, because to your point, all of them are really connected. And I think that the final thing that has been really interesting uh, for me, having come from publicly traded large multinationals to a mutual organization is the concept of who's influencing your strategy around purpose and social impact. And, you know, there's a lot of organizations and institutional investors that want to see a climate strategy and they want to see a diversity and equity strategy and then they want to see a social impact strategy. And so from a corporate perspective, you see organizations structuring that way. They have a DEI team and then they have a climate team and then they have a social impact team. But what's missing there is that there is uh, interconnectivity across all, all those elements. And equity equity in and of itself should not be a standalone entity. It should be built into every strategy across the board, including your, your business strategy. And so um, we're missing an opportunity to link those strategies, to reinforce uh, granting in that way where you're seeing the synergies between those topics. Um, and there are major gaps that are appearing now when strategies are seen as independent. And so um, we're hoping again that the more we can talk about how we've built our strategy, um, which which is all overlaid and interconnected, and also reports directly to our CEO and the board, so it's at a strategic level, at a corporate level, um, that those things actually do help to rebuild um, and think about strategy differently and have a much greater impact. That's remarkable. Um, it's a perfect segue to my next question, but. To be able to have line of sight directly to your governance, to your board and your CEO is so important in terms of sustainability. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there's these different layers and filters, um, which creates a dynamic where there's a, it's, it's, it's hard to have organizational learning or even sector learning. And then one of the greatest right. challenges I find is just how data is collected and shared amongst funders mm -hmm. and amongst partners. And I, so I think mm -hmm. that um, the model that you're I'm um, sharing is truly remarkable. Once again, I appreciate your candor and leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so my next question, um, do you have a set of key priorities right now in your work? Yeah, I think from a social impact perspective, um, one is around collaboration and, and revisiting what that looks like. 
uh, again, you know, we're the sole funder right now of the Climate and Equity Lab, but we're going out this year for more partners. There's a lot of interest, again, from credit unions, mutuals, and co-ops um, that work in this space. Uh, and our intention is to bring other partners along with us on this journey to really showcase what collaboration could look like at an industry level, which I think is fascinating. We're all touching upon the same topics. Everyone is being really secretive around different initiatives that they're doing. And that's to the detriment of the charitable partners, to the communities. We can leverage a lot of that research. Let's not re keep recreating the wheel. And so for us, collaboration is a huge component of what we're doing and then the second piece for us from a social impact perspective that is, is going to be key this year is around capacity building for our charitable partners. Um, over the last you know six months, uh, one of my colleagues, Chantel Moore, who manages all of the work related to our foundation, has done a considerable amount of research around impact measurement and the barriers for charities to deliver on the impact measurement requests from their grantors. And so um, one of the things that we have found is uh, by asking them, and, and really engaging with them on the topic is, is what are some of the things that are the barriers to them? Do they have solutions themselves that they would be able to implement if they had funding? And so this, the next couple of months, we're actually piloting um, specific impact measurement granting. So for all of the, for so all of our strategic partnerships, or for most of them, we've selected a couple, um, we're going to top up the approved grant for them specifically to go to impact measurement. And we're not telling them how to use that money. So it might be a, a tech solution. It might be software. It might be uh, hiring a body to actually do it. It might be training. And then we're actually uh, culminating this with a conference that we're going to hold for our own charitable partners in September in Cambridge, which is where our head office is in Cambridge, Ontario. We're going to bring them all together and we're going to have them share with each other what they did with the funding, what actually worked. And we do feel that as a grantor, we have to capacity, we have to build the capacity for our charities to deliver on what we may actually need and for them to understand why we need it. And so um, that conference for us is really important because we're also going to have external speakers talking on the the issues that are most important to the charitable sector. Now that includes cyber, that includes AI, that includes impact measurement and bring in external speakers to speak to them because oftentimes they don't even have funding to go to conferences um, and to participate in this. And so this is free of cost to all the charities uh, that are partnering with us this year. And so capacity building for us, again, is, is a different level of relationship building and trust building to say, we want to understand how we can help the sector really uh, meet the needs that they're trying to tackle in an incredibly challenging time. That's incredible. I, and I, I have to do a shameless plug for the work that's happening <laughs> at the Canadian Center for Nonprofit Digital Resilience, the folks at Decolonizing Data Institute, right. the great impact measurement work that Kate Ruff and her team at Common, Common Approach are facilitating mm -hmm. their new power labs. There's so many um, remarkable models across the country where folks are finding ways and means to not just collect data differently, especially high quality disaggregated demographic data, but finding ways to analyze this data, um, protect it, preserve it, cultivate it, steward it, govern it, and then disseminate it. So once again, I applaud your leadership and obviously um, visionary leadership in this instance, because a lot of funders aren't doing that type of work. So once again, congratulations. Yes. So, so my next question, how do you feel about the future of social impact work in Canada? Are you optimistic? Are you hopeful? Are you pessimistic? How do you feel? <laughs> I'm, I'm always an optimist. I'm always, I'm always someone that says, look, we got to keep smiling and we got it. We got to carry on. I think Victor, you're very similar in that nature. Um, yeah, I think I think that there is there is a strong need for us to get this right. Um, COVID may have passed, but there's another crisis just around the corner, and I suspect it's going to be the climate crisis. And um, we we have to find new ways of doing things. And I think leaders like you, leaders like um, like the the leadership team at Future of Good and other organizations that you mentioned, and Social Innovation Canada and others, are really trying to create that ecosystem to be ready for the next one and to think about granting and uh, and grantor relationships more strategically to really start disseminating power and giving that power to those that that have the answers and then can help us get to solutions faster. Um, and I would say that the more that we can start linking some of those strategies together, like I was talking about social impact and climate and equity, um, we don't have time to solve for one issue before we do another one. These are all coming at us at the same time. And again, COVID was a reinforcer of that. Um, 
that the more we can link these together, create this environment of, of collaboration versus competition and see the benefit that, that corporate Canada can really have on what social impact can be in the future is, is, is really exciting. And again, you know, the more of us are, that are in this field that are, that are willing to learn and take and, and, and disseminate what we've learned from the past um, as the truth uh, and understand from other organizations and group and indigenous leaders of what this can look like in the future, the better it will be. But um, we have to go up. There's no, there's no other option right now. I couldn't agree more. And a big shout out to Anouk and Venata, Future of Good, as well as our brilliant, um, remarkable colleague, Andrea at SI Canada. I couldn't yeah. agree more. Building these relationships and building the ecosystem that's based off of collaboration and not competition or silos mm -hmm. is the only way that we're going to get from one place to the next. And, and we have to move forward. Um, so my last or second last question, I should say, is what is your ultimate goal and what does success look like and feel like to you and your colleagues? Oh, that's a hard one. I would say that um, I'll, I'll start with the company one and then I'll add a personal one at the end. I think for our team, um, we we want to create change. We want to be a bit of the instigators. And, and for an organization of our size, as I said, our, our corporate structure as a mutual is a huge benefit for the work that we do. Um, we're not going to lie. We're not a huge organization. We're not, you know, a multinational. Um, but we know that we can have influence from the way that we approach our work. I think we're getting more attraction right now, not for what we're granting to, but how we're doing it. And that to me, I think really reinforces the nature of um, a lot of small, smaller organizations can really influence the landscape. And that's really what we want to do and, and create space for other organizations, um, specifically those led by equity deserving groups to get their voice out there and for us to move aside and create a platform for them. For that, that I think would be a big success for us in the next couple of years. Um, for me personally, you know, I'm not, uh, I've been in this space for a long time. I fell on it by accident, which often happens, but you know, my, my goal was to work in the nonprofit sector and, and, um, that was short lived because I, I got to move into the space that was growing. And, um, I was really fascinated when, when rules came out that talked about community impact in, at a bank, I was like, I don't understand what that means. And so, um, I've gotten to grow in that space. And I, I think, the the best compliment for me would be when someone says, you know, Gabby comes here to listen um, or Gabby comes here to learn. Uh, I, I often start my board meetings with, I don't have all the solutions. <laughs> I think what I want to do is garner questions um, and, and really create an environment where we can ask ourselves those difficult questions and have those debates um, around the topics that, that we need to debate about, you know, whether it's as a leadership team um, or as a board. Um, or even within our team. And I think, um, you know, that's, I'm hoping is the reputation that I can have as someone that that is willing to listen uh, and learn and do things differently. Absolutely. You have more than a reputation. We've always had a great <laughs> relationships. So I appreciate all that you do for so many. So my last question, do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action for our listeners and our viewers? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, my biggest call to action would be, you know, reach out to your charitable partners and talk to them and don't invite them to your office. Don't do it by Wi-Fi. Go to their offices and meet their teams and learn who, about the people that they're trying to serve. Um, you know, be open to learning the things that you don't know. And I think that that in and of itself, that, that personal relationship changes everything, right, in terms of the mindset. Um, I think for charities and corporates alike, talk to your competitors. Um, you know, one of the things that we have also found, you know, in the charitable sector, and again, I think this comes from uh, how how power dynamics have been built, that charities compete with each other for funding. When there's so much synergies and so much great work that can happen if we work together. And so there's other things we're doing uh, that we're going to launch later this year that's going to help to foster that. Um, but I would say the same thing for the corporate sector. Talk more with your competitors about what you're trying to achieve, what you could achieve together. You know, that's something that we in the insurance industry are doing more and more of, specifically the impact that climate is going to have both on our business as well as to our policyholders and communities. And so that would be my call to action is get out of the office, go and meet people face to face, learn about what they're trying to achieve and see how we can really help each other. 
Ashe, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for your consistent solidarity, your leadership, your authenticity, and your willingness to always show up. Um, it's 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 truly remarkable, and I love the work that you do, Gabby. Thank you. And as Thank always, you so much. no problem. And as always, at yeah. see, we close the way we began by acknowledging and giving thanks to our Creator. We acknowledge all the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders, the community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, Gabby. We so appreciate you. Thank you.